You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> I have to reconstruct the objectives. What are the objectives? In the words of one member, might is right. If you have the power, you use it to achieve your objectives. What is the objective? As you look at the histories of individual members, it can only be one thing. To acquire power, to keep power, to use power for their own purposes. That year, that senior year, selects the next group from the junior class. Um, within the order, each 15, each group of 15 uh, are known as clubs. I call them cells because they're very close to the Jacobin cell, the revolutionary cells, but internally they refer to them as, as, as clubs. Each club has an identifying number. For example, Avril Harriman is, is a, a very influential member of the order, the son of um, Edward Harriman, the railroad magnate. Um, Harriman was initiated in 1913. His club number is D111. Um, all, his, all the other 14 of D111 have died off. Avril Harriman is the only one left. To come to the other part of your question, who are some of the significant members? Today, two men stand out. One is Avril Harriman, who is the I suppose the chief financial angel of the Democratic Party. The other is Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bush family is uh, quite prominent within the order. Now if you go back in history a little, you'll find that George Bush's father, Prescott Sheldon Bush, was also a member of the order. He was a member of Brown Brothers Harriman, which is the Harriman Private Banking Company. So today you've got two men who are supposedly in politics in opposition, Bush and Harriman. Actually, they're members of the same secret society, and Bush's father was not only a member, he was a partner in the, what was then, Harriman and Company, which later became Brown Brothers Harriman. So behind the scenes, and this is something you don't see until you investigate it, People who appear to be in opposition politically or financially or industrially or in many ways um, are working together. Other members might be William Buckley. Now, William Buckley became a member in 1949, but the preceding class to that was Bush, 1848. So you get Bush was amongst the 15 who selected Buckley, and Buckley's club... That 15 was the 15 that selected, for example, one of the new members for 50 was the Reverend Sloan Coffin, Jr. The Reverend Sloan Coffin, Jr. at Yale was at the core of the anti-Vietnamese um, anti war disturbances on Yale campus. This is typical. You'll find that men in the same society will take opposite positions in public. So you've got William Buckley, whom I call a House Conservative as a member, but so is a man, for example, called Edwin Burt, who has a string of communist affiliations, which is about that long. And we'll get into this later. The method they use is that of the Hegelian dialectic. Thesis played against antithesis leads to a synthesis. In other words, for Hegel, for history to make progress, you have to have conflict. And when you look at the key people, in the order, you will find that they generate conflict. So Bush and Harriman politically are conflicting. Um, Coffin and Buckley, although part of the same order, are in public conflicting with one another because conflict leads to the new synthesis. Other prominent members, one of the most prominent was Howard William Taft, the only man to be both president and chief justice of the United States. The Taft family founded the order in the United States. There have been eight members, eight Taft family members within the order. Um, uh, Taft was uh, probably the most prominent member around the turn of the century, 1910-1920. Uh, Stimson, who was Secretary of War under Taft, then Secretary of State under Hoover, 
Secretary of War under Roosevelt. Uh, in other words, um, at that level, politics disappears and people often wonder why does a Democrat join a Republican administration. If you check back, you'll find often there's not as a member of the order. So key people would be people like Taft, uh, Stimson, um, Archibald McLeish, who wrote the Constitution for UNESCO, also a librarian of Congress, uh, the Bush family, the Walker family, um, and above all today, if there's a godfather in the order, it's Avril Harriman. Exactly what causes does the order espouse, and why are these divergent to those of our founding fathers? Well, the causes, one can only deduce at this point from the operations of these men as individuals and working together. Um, they want to acquire power above all. Power Political to do what? power. As you look at their actions, the political power is to bring about what they call a new world order, which is a one world. But they use the Hegelian techniques, and we know enough about Hegel to know that not only does this mean the dialectic process, the creation of conflict, but it also means that individuals such as you and I, or anybody watching this program, will be cogs in the state, that we have no individual rights, our rights for, rights for Hegel, individual rights for Hegel come about through obedience to the state. Uh, we see it in the educational process, which we'll probably talk about later, that we have adopted what I call a Hegelian system of education, which is not to bring out your innate talents, but to prepare you to be an individual cog in the state. Now, are you saying the members of the order believe this and this is a part of their worldview? I would say that there is a minority within the order that does believe it. There's one thing I've learned in looking at the papers, that they're not all active. Maybe at any one time only 20% are active. Undoubtedly, the 20% that are active have this goal. If you look at Tuft, Tuft's great work, although as a president he hasn't accounted for very much in the literature, Tuft's great work was to bring about uh, the world court, international law. International law in a world court will be essential in a new world order. If you take, for example, the career of Bush, Vice President Bush, when he was ambassador to the United Nations, he helped a process called Mundialization, uh, which was a process by which an individual American city would adopt a um, United Nations uh, statue. In other words, it's a diminution, a dilution of U.S. sovereignty. So if you look at these individuals, O. Stimson is another very good example. Avril Harriman, certainly, in the way he's financed the Soviet Union, his work towards the build-up of the Soviet Union. If you look at these individuals and ask what is the common pattern, the common pattern is the creation of a one world. Now, supposedly, these people believe that they are great benefactors of our society, the wise men, those who are especially endowed to rule, and who also believe that uh, the best interests of, the Mer of America happen to be their own best interests as well. I have never seen anything in the literature which um, um, leads me to believe that they have our individual rights in their hearts. What I do see in the literature and in the documents is a, a, um, a ruthless drive to acquire power for themselves and to help each other because this is one of the tenets of the order that if you have three men coming before you for a job, the preference absolutely goes to your brother in the order. This is um, in my book, The Order, Introduction to the Order, I, I call these chains of influence, and I trace one pattern where Stimson uh, brought the McBundy family into the War Department, then the McBundys go on and become key people both in the Department of Defense and in the Council on Foreign Relations. They help each other along the way. And when you get even a small number of men doing this, uh, it can exert a very powerful force, a very powerful influence. So the basic assumption is that because they know what is best for America, the way to preserve that is to amass power to see to it 
that the destiny they envision comes to pass. My assessment is they're not thinking what is best for America, they're thinking what is best for the order. What is best for the order, the order comes first. is what is best for America in the first in in their that eyes. order. Yes, in their eyes. Yes. What's good for us has to be good for America, so we will remold America mm -hmm. according to their pattern. That's right. Yeah. It remains secret for 150 years because these people are under an oath not to talk about it. I understand that a member of the order may not remain in the room if it comes under discussion. Now, if I can elaborate on this a little bit, this poses a problem for Mr. Bush because I write something called the Phoenix Letter, which is a monthly newsletter, and last November I began to open up. And a reader wrote to Mr. Bush and said, uh, is what uh, Mr. Sutton says, are you a member of this order? And the letter he got, the reader got back was very interesting. Um, it said in effect that the vice president was not a member of a sordid secret society. That was not the question. The question was, are you a member of a secret society? The answer came back, he is not a member of a sordid secret society. <laughs> he inserted the word, you see. Uh, this was a reader who doesn't give up, so he went back again. <laughs> and um, I understand that, uh, as it stands, as we are now, that Mr. Bush is not willing either to admit he is a member of the order or to deny it, because they're under this oath not to discuss it. So when people look at the Council on Foreign Relations, in effect what they've been doing is looking at a kind of a veil which hides the order? Yes. Uh, the core, or my work, came about almost by accident. If someone had not donated to me the membership list, we wouldn't be here today. It's remained secret because nobody has done that. Everybody's been looking at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers. They're not truly conspiracies because the membership list are open. The membership list of the order has not been open. So there's a distinction between the CFR and the Trilaterals and the order. CFR and Trilaterals are not conspiracies because they are not secret. They do what comes back. <laughs> and this, of course, is very different to arguing to many people who have promoted conspiracy have made, they get across the idea that these people telephone each other and have little drawings and maps and diagrams. They don't operate like that at all. If you meet these people, they think alike. They talk alike. They come up with the same idea simultaneously and they move simultaneously. They know what they have to do. So they're a breed. They're a breed. Exactly. Now, Tony, what has this breed done? What are their chief accomplishments in molding a domestic and foreign policy and actual events in American history since their founding at Yale? One is they have acquired enormous political and financial power. You'll find representatives of the order in politics. As well, what have they done with this power? What, have they, what has happened to okay. America that would not have happened had they not been the order? Uh, creation of war and revolution. Specifically, which ones? I, the, third, on the third book in this series, which I'm bringing out, takes two wars and one revolution. Well, two revolutions, excuse me, two revolutions in one war. Uh, World War II, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the rise of Hitler, which I call a revolution in Germany. We can find the order behind the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. We can find the behind the rise of Hitler. We can find the behind, we can find the behind, in the maintenance of both of these systems, the now, transfer of technology to both. Since you've already proven that Wall Street is behind the Bolshevik Revolution and the rise of Hitler, now you're proving that the order is behind Wall Street. Exactly. Now who's the key figure in the order or figures that uh, mold Wall Street? In order of dominance, Avril Harriman, partner in Brown Brothers Harriman. Uh, Stanley, of Morgan Stanley. It used to be J.P. Morgan, then it became Morgan Stanley. Stanley. Uh, those two are the key. Now, what did the order want to accomplish in the Bolshevik Revolution? You create opposing forces which you place in conflict. Out of conflict, you've got profit. You've got political power and you can direct history. And if you look at the writings, for example, of the Trilateral Commission, they talk openly in the Trilateral Commission about managing conflicts, not solving conflicts, but managing, managing conflicts. conflicts.